My name is John Thornhill. I'm an innovation editor at the Financial Times in London. Uh, it's a great pleasure to moderate this panel today and to be back in Helsinki. I think the first time I was in Helsinki was in the 1990s. Uh, I was writing about the pulp and paper industry. Uh, it's obviously a very important industry, but not quite as interesting as what's going on today. Something crazily good has happened in this part of the world since I was last here. So, uh, welcome to our panelists today. We're going to be talking about uh, Tom's report. Uh, we have Roxanne Vaza, who is a director of Station F, the startup campus in Paris, and then Sebastian Simiotkowski, who is uh, the co-founder of Klarna. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I wondered if we could start. Um, being a journalist, I take a bit of a more skeptical take than uh, Tom. And I wanted to ask about how fast Europe really is moving. Uh, I mean, it clearly is going uh, very quickly, but is it going as fast as it needs to compared to the rest of the world and what is going on in the US and China? And if you look at some of the stats, um, the EU still has no digital companies in the global top 15 by market capitalization, digital companies, and accounts for just 4% of the 200 leading online platforms. So when are we going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with China and the US? Sebastian, do you want to start on this? Uh, I think actually uh, European companies compared to US ones are very competitive and doing extremely well. I think China is a different league. And we should all be very happy that that market is so big that they're currently focusing on winning their own market rather than coming and competing with us guys. Uh, the Chinese are faster, more hardworking, smarter, more creative. <laughs> um, and, but we're happy to be here in Europe. There's less competition here uh, as well as in the US. OK. And Roxanne, you were born in Palo Alto, I believe. Uh, so you have a very American perspective on what's going on. How do you think Europe stacks up globally? So before we get into all the Europe bashing that I think we traditionally <laughs> love to do, um, I actually think we should top, stop and take a minute to actually consider all the positive things that have happened. I think $17 billion companies in one year alone, that's incredible. Um, the number of developers being ahead of the US, having increasing numbers, um, that's not something that we should overlook. Uh, I think Tom mentioned in his presentation as well the number of IPOs, some of the biggest IPOs if you want to consider it in Silicon Valley this year, we're European companies. Um, so I think that's stuff that we really cannot ignore. And actually, um, it's just a matter of time. So your question was about time. And I will let Tom tell you when that time is. <laughs> well, Tom? I think it's, um, we can spend a lot of time looking at indicators that tell us what's happened in the past. Or we can s spend time, which is what we're trying to do with the report, to look at the data to give us an indication of what's happening in the future. And I think for a long time, we've been talking about the promise of European tech. And I think this year, as I said, it's been this incredible record-breaking year. And I, you know, Roxanne just, just gave the numbers. But I think we can feel confident in our ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe when we've produced four companies with an IPO of you know, 5 billion or more. And there were fewer, actually, in the US this year. I think Sebastian's absolutely right that China is a, is a special case. And I think you can't overlook the fact of the, you know, the special conditions of that market. Um, you know, I think Roxanne also kind of just said, we're just getting started. And you know, we made the point around diversity and inclusion. We've kind of ha had all of this progress. And we've done it with our hands tied behind our back and on our knees. So just imagine you know, how much more we're going to achieve, not only when we're able to build um, an ecosystem that's inclusive and that speaks to all its people, but also once we start tapping all those markets outside the UK and Germany and the Nordics, there's almost, you know, yeah. we've barely got started in, uh, in tapping the potential from, uh, from, from, from sort of Eastern and Central European and South, Southern Europe. So I'm super excited. All right, I want to come back to that in just a minute. I mean, one of the things that has massively changed in Europe over the past few years, as is evidenced by this event, is the cultural change that has happened. And we were just chatting backstage about uh, what people wanted to do when they left university. So, Ro Roxanne, um, you're at Station F, this startup campus. Clearly, a, being an entrepreneur is very fashionable in France now. Can you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I've seen a huge change. We were talking kind of over the last 10 years. Um, 
you know, when I first when I first came out to Europe, it kind of was very far from being trendy to be an entrepreneur. And I think there's some numbers today that show that in certain countries, it's roughly 70% of young graduates actually want to be an entrepreneur. Um, now there's some debate about whether that's healthy or not. Should everybody be launching a company? Um, so there's probably going to be some kind of fashionable trends that are going to have people come and go and some uh, less valuable companies be created. But I think that's just the name of the game. So there's an image outside France that most people want to go and become a bureaucrat and go to ENA. Not that's no at, longer true. Not at all the case, no. <laughs> and Sebastian, when you were at Stockholm School of Economics, um, did people want to be an entrepreneur and how much has it changed? I mean, when we started Klarna, there was 7% that wanted to become entrepreneurs and today 70. Uh, so that's a massive shift. Back then, I mean, you got to remember, this was before the financial crisis. People wanted to go and work at Goldman Sachs and and Morgan Stanley and McKinsey, um, which is not the case anymore, right? But I also think that like, in Sweden at least, and I think to, to some degree in other parts of Europe as well, it's not only about, un like, it's kind of interesting to see this blend of, it's both about being an entrepreneur, but it's also about making an impact in the world and trying to create some kind of company that can benefit the world, right? And that's, those two trends have been combined in a very exciting th way, I think, because, I mean, one is that people who have this desire to make an improvement actually use a company as a vehicle to do that. And I think that can be very disruptive and have a good, very good impact on the world because operating as a company is a smart way to operate, I think. So I think that's a, that's a cool trend. And I want to just highlight on the US and e e Europe comparison, obviously that's close to my heart, it's just that, I mean, I think there's different industries, but when it comes to fintech, I mean, Europe is so far ahead uh, of, compared to the US. Like in the US, you may mention one or two companies. In Europe, I don't know, like 15, 20, which are probably all of them by now over a billion dollar valuation and are doing extremely well. So, and I think, that's a, I think there's a number of reasons for that, but I also would highlight that we never give the EU credit for anything. That's why we all hate <laughs> it and some people want to leave it or are even planning <laughs> to leave it. But actually, like PSD2, for example, is just such an amazing change Mm -hmm. for the benefit of the consumer, to protect the consumer's interest and allow the consumers to switch and so forth. So, I mean, here actually the regulators, they're doing worse in other areas like stock options and stuff, but in this area they're actually doing a lot to help the mm -hmm. fintech industry and in general make Europe to be ahead of the game. So, it's pretty cool. It's always a great thing for a Briton to hear what a wonderful thing the EU is, <laughs> just at the point that we're going to leave, but uh, we'll leave that aside for the moment. Um, now, you, we were talking about the culture change one area that clearly does have to change a lot more uh, that was identified in the Atomico report is on the issue of gender and inclusion and diversity. Um, and they're really quite shocking numbers about gender diversity, if not unsurprising, I guess. So um, I'd like to ask all of you, what do you think can be done about this? How can tech be made more inclusive? Roxanne, do you want to start? So I'm really glad that we're talking about this because it's a huge issue. Um, and I, I'm glad that we also called it out a little bit by what it is, because I do think a lot of people consider it to be someone else's problem. And nobody actually comes out and says, you know, yes, we are an all-male team, or we, are, you know, we have issues with uh, inclusion diversity as our team. So I'm really glad that we actually put our finger on that. Um, again, I also want to be realistic. It's not a European problem. And I do think that means actually there's a huge uh, potential for Europe to even take the lead as a worldwide leader in, in actually changing that and making a difference. Now, what actually needs to be done, um, there's a lot of different things, a lot of organizations that are out there um, making suggestions kind of as a, on a grassroots level. Um, but I, actually, I think we actually need a different type of movement today. Like we've, we've had a lot over the, the past year, year and a half around Me Too. Uh, it was a lot of calling out bad behavior, and I'm sad that we had to go that route, but apparently people didn't know what was bad behavior. Um, and now I think we need a movement kind of in the opposite sense. What is good behavior? What are initiatives we should be doing and recognizing and things that we should be following? So I think we kind of have to take a, a different approach now um, to, to the way things are handled. Okay. Sebastian, what, what do you think on this issue? Look, I think it's all complex problems, so unfortunately there are no silver bullet solutions, right? And I think it's, it's a lot of mixes, but I think that some important aspects are obviously into role modeling and, you know, as people get more successful, highlight the cases of, of that. I think diversity obviously stretched beyond gender as well. I mean, in our case at Klarna, for example, we have 80 nationalities. So uh, people from 80 different countries working there. So I think that like, so again, like our ability to kind of recruit from all over the world, bring people and so forth, these are also things that drives And what an are you improvement. specifically doing to make that happen? Are you going out and finding? Yeah, I mean, in our case, it's actually the problem is Stockholm is just not big enough. I mean, we have Spotify, we have ourselves, we have iSettle. There's a lot of successful companies. 
And there's simply, we can't find enough people. So bringing people from all over the world. Now, it's because of the current political winds, it's becoming a little bit more challenging. But, but it, you know, Sweden has been a great country in that sense to be able to bring talent from all over the world. Uh, and now we're also bringing even more to Berlin, actually, which we're growing much faster in because of, um, and, and that's an amazing, you know, multicultural city that you can bring people from all the world. So. Right, Tom, what do you think? What can practically be done to ch help yeah. change this? I mean, I, mean, I think R Roxanne called it out. And one of the things we highlight in the report is the number of amazing initiatives that have already proliferated um, that are having positive impact. Even in the UK alone, we came up with 28 different initiatives that are tackling it from one way or another. I think the reality is, you know, step one is to be conscious of the fact that there's a problem. And then I think step two is recognition of the fact that we all have a responsibility including us as investors. And then I think it's about taking those first few steps. And we, um, we actually introduced into our term sheet earlier this year a clause that, um, that asks of the companies that we invest into to put into place a diversity and inclusion policy if they don't have one in place already within six months. And that was something that got an amazing reaction from, from all of the founders. But one of the bits of feedback that came back was, OK, well, how do we do it? Which is why we've launched this guidebook, uh -huh. which will help entrepreneurs and leaders to know how to think about, how to plan, how to build, how to implement, how to measure, and how to iterate the policies and put it at the core of their companies. And I think, as I said, it requires making it a first and foremost priority. Does that mean that you won't invest in companies that don't have sufficient diversity? I, I think if we found <laughs> that, um, that there was a resistance, then that would be something that we would think about. Yeah, absolutely. OK. I just wanted to jump onto the back of that, actually. I also think it's really important that when we talk about diversity, we don't just narrow it down to men and women. I actually think there's, diversity means a lot more than just that. Um, it, I think one thing that we tried to do, for example, at Station F is also address underprivileged entrepreneurs, people that are not just coming out of business schools and engineering schools, but also people that may have very, very different backgrounds and struggled quite a bit, and they don't have a degree, and they're a refugee, and maybe they've you know, had a very difficult situation. And I think that's also something we really need to address and consider with the different diversity initiatives. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that came out of the report was that, as Tom has been saying, uh, tech is going right across Europe now. It's not just confined to London, Paris, Berlin, Stockholm. Um, Sebastian, I wondered if you could give us a sense of where you think the next kind of hot spots are around Europe. As you said, Klarna is now operating in lots of different markets. Uh, where do you think uh, the, the, the next hot spots are going to be in Europe? I'm not sure if it's the next. I mean, Berlin has been on the map for a long period of time, but I just feel that like it has a lot of prerequisites that other places are lacking, right? It has cheap housing, cheap accommodation, it's, and it's also a very attractive young city for young people to come from all of Europe. More so, to be honest, than Stockholm, even though I love Stockholm, it's an amazing many ways. But um, so it, just in general, I think the prominence of Berlin is going to continue to rise, to be honest. It's, it's center, and it's, it's a popular place to be. Um, and then hopefully, you know, we'll see more parts in Eastern Europe as well happening. I mean, I think what's cool today is also, I meet so many founders today, which would say like, yeah, we are like four people here, and, you know, we have a couple of developers in Ukraine, and we have this and that, right? So I think nowadays, like this whole video conference, we talked about that 15, 20 years ago, people are going to work on a distance. But actually, the technology is starting to get to a maturity level where actually you can work on a distance from each other in a way. Mm -hmm. So start seeing companies that are more geographically spread out as well, which is pretty cool. Right. Now, it used to be said that 10, 15 years ago, entrepreneurs in Europe went to Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> five years ago, they went to London, Paris, Berlin, Stockholm. Uh, what's happening in France, Roxanne? I mean, are, if you set up a, a business in Lyon, uh, would you stay there or would you come and work in Station F in Paris? Yeah, I think France has changed dramatically. I mean, you said it a few years ago. I think people would look at France. If you were a foreigner and you wanted to build your company there, you would laugh and you would not even consider it. Um, and today, that is not the case at all. We see tons of international uh, entrepreneurs from around the world wanting to come and base their companies there. I think, obviously, some of it has been impacted by Brexit, by Donald Trump in the US, by high Silicon Valley prices. So we see, actually, people, instead of going to those locations, now they're coming to France. And I think you can be based anywhere you want. I mean, I think Sebastian said it great. Um, 
You have teams that are you know, scattered throughout Europe. You can be based one place, have your team somewhere else. You can even hop around. I see entrepreneurs now that they'll be six months here, six months somewhere else. And I think that's, that's beautiful, and that allows you really to become an international company. Right. Sebastian, you were talking about uh, what the EU has done to create a, more of a kind of digital single market, but there are still lots of areas where it's deficient. Um, and one of the charts in the report, which I thought was quite interesting, was that so many companies decide to open their first international office in the US or, or even Australia than they do necessarily in their neighboring country. Now, Tom points out that that's because they don't necessarily need to open a, 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 an office in a neighboring country. But still, there's uh, very much a focus that you have to make it in the US. And Klarna itself, you're operating in the US. When do you think it will be when Europe really does have a kind of single digital market, that it will be just as easy to operate in Stockholm as it is in Paris, as it is in Berlin, as it is in Belgrade? I mean, language barriers will always exist, of course. But I do think that one of the fallacies of EU is that they have harmonized the business rules, but they haven't harmonized consumer rules, right? And so consequentially, as you move throughout Europe, the consumer rules, like specifically for us in banking, it's even worse. But just in general, it's a problem that there are specific setups and every country will interpret these consumer rules in different ways, even though they're officially recommended. Just look at GDPR, even that. So, so the point is that like, I think that's, that's the kind of next challenge. Obviously, currently, it's a little bit challenging to, to drive that political change through the EU. Um, but I think we, I mean, the problem with the EU really is that currently we all sit and vote for people to go there to grab as much money of that coming back to ourselves. And any organization that is built up on everyone trying to grab as much as possible benefit from it is not going to be a very successful one. We, there has to be a revival of the idea that as us sharing something and making some sacrifices jointly to achieve some, a greater common good, that that is the reason behind doing it, and that's what's going to make it better. And unfortunately, that's not where the political climate is today, right? Yeah. So. And in France, Roxanne, I mean, President Macron has clearly been very interested in the whole kind of uh, tech sector, and he's been a very kind of pro-European president. Is he going to be a kind of driving force for some of these changes we need to see? I hope so. <laughs> um, I think just jumping on the back of what uh, Sebastian said, um, I actually have seen quite a bit of change with regards to the number of companies that actually consider the U.S. as their second market after their local country. Um, just in the past few years, I think we're seeing companies that now they'll, they'll actually consider the U.S. much, much later in the game and they consider launching a number of European markets at the same time or from very, very early on. So even if maybe um, the numbers don't show it yet, I think we're probably at the beginning of a new trend. Tom. I, I just want to go make one, one extra point, which I think is we should embrace this. Because you know, we've been talking a long time about how do we grow the ambition levels of the companies that emerge from Europe. And ultimately, we want to build global winners. And you know, I think being a global winner requires winning in the US too. And so it's to the extent that that's on the roadmap, where, whether it comes first or whether it comes after an expansion in Europe, it's absolutely the type of ambition that we want to see. And there's, you know, as, we, as, uh, as I said earlier, we're seeing more and more European companies cross the pond and have success. And that's a great thing. Now, one of the p other points that you uh, made in your presentation was that uh, how little uh, institutional investors tend to put into VCs and startups. Um, and I uh, met Reid Hoffman in London the other day who was talking about his whole philosophy of blitzscaling. Uh, it's quite hard to blitzscale if you don't have this massive pool of capital which is prepared to be thrown at uh, companies like Uber to sustain them for a decade of loss making before they go public. Um, do you sense that there is a change uh, in the pension fund industry? Are they becoming more interested in this sector, Tom? I mean, absolutely, is, this, is the simple answer. But I think it's, it's not necessarily as simple as they start to recognize what's happening and the money flows. You know, I think there are some structural challenges that, that need to be overcome. Um, not least in terms of the ability to deploy um, certain check sizes. But I think we have conversations all the time with, uh, with pension funds. And I think the thing that has really made a difference is the, the transformation of performance of European venture capital, which is driven by the amazing companies that have emerged from Europe. And I think, of course, you know, what are these institutional investors trying to chase, it's, it's yield. Um, 
And so when you see that European VC can be competitive with US VC and it's competitive to European buyout, then you'll see that rebalancing happen. And, and it's happening. It's happening here in the Nordics fastest. And you know, I think the more that we can educate and the more that we can close this knowledge gap, the faster it will happen elsewhere too. Right. Um, we're drawing to a close, but I just want uh, to ask all of you for what advice you would give to all of the entrepreneurs in the room. Uh, Sebastian, wh what is the one thing that you've learned in your career that you think would benefit the people in this audience? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, um, I would say in the end, actually, it's going to sound a little bit cheesy, but just follow your heart, to be honest. And like, don't, like, it's great to take advice from other people, but I mean, life is really about doing what you believe in, and you don't want to regret that you listen too much. So just like follow your inner voice and do what you think is right. So as the singers said at the beginning, um, or sang at the beginning, uh, life is not a dress rehearsal, it's the show, I believe. Roxanne, do you have a bit of advice? Um, yeah, I guess I will draw also on personal experience and kind of in a similar theme to what Sebastian just said. But like when I moved to Europe about 10 years ago, people looked at me and they were like, you're crazy. You love startups. You're born in Silicon Valley and you're moving to France. And uh, I think now people would totally not question that choice. Um, and I, I just want to like kind of hit that statement that a lot of ecosystems are growing, changing, developing very quickly. So if you want to be based somewhere, if you believe in the place that you're at, stay there because it will change. Well, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. But just before we leave the stage, um, I actually want to make an announcement. Uh, as a journalist, I tend to report the news rather than make it. But I do have some news today that I would like to share with you exclusively. Um, in the first quarter of next year, with a team of very smart journalists and entrepreneurs and investors, I am launching a Financial Times-backed but separately run media site called Sifted uh, to cover Europe's blossoming tech sector. I've been so convinced by what I've heard today that I'm actually going to set up a startup and try to write about all of this. We intend to deliver the best journalism to tell this largely untold story of what is going right across Europe in some of the regional cities as well as the centers. We will focus on many of the issues that we've been talking about today, and we want to sift the best of the content that's already out there to help you as entrepreneurs. We've already hired five great reporters, including Maya Palmer uh, from the Financial Times. Not only is she a great tech journalist, but she is also Finnish so she can really speak your language in all senses of the word. And she will actually be moderating the next session. Uh, we are going to double our team over the next few weeks and will launch in quarter one of next year. For the moment, we're a very scrappy startup, like many of you, and we have a very scrappy website called sifted.eu. Please sign up for our emails. Look out for these leaflets, which uh, we are going to be handing around today, and have a look at our site. We want to create a media platform for you to share your big ambitions and achievements and to give you and Europe a stronger voice in the global tech debate. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for a wonderful discussion. And uh, on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you.